Kia ora tata, everybody. Bruce Arrell's my name. I'm the director of the Goodfellow Unit, and it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Dr. Hari Taurija, who's a renal physician at Middlemore Hospital. Uh, he also does a private practice at Ponsonby. Uh, he trained in Ottawa in Canada and uh, has a master's degree from Harvard. So tonight he's going to be talking about renal issues, and uh, I'll hand over to you, Hari. So welcome. Thanks very much, Bruce. Thanks for the invitation to talk about um, kidney issues. So we chose this topic um, um, because recently I had a few um, primary care colleagues of mine who actually asked about, you know, we do see it from time to time, the acute kidney injury. So um, they wanted a sense of what to do when you see the creatinine going up in different situations. When do we kind of seek help? Uh, what should we do? Um, when we see the creatinine is going up, what should be our first step? And then when should we get in touch with um, the specialist at the hospital or should we call you directly if it's a private patient? Um, so that's the reason I thought it would be good to kind of just uh, revise, uh, go through the basics of uh, acute kidney injury. And at the same time, I'll take this opportunity to kind of give you guys some updates happening in the world of CKD and hypertension. These are the recent most uh, things, changes, which probably it'll be good for us to know. Um, I have nothing to disclose. So in today's talk, um, we'll try and focus on a few things. Firstly, recognize the acute kidney injury. And uh, this is very important. Uh, once you've recognized this, what are the initial in investigations you would be thinking of? And then when you keep an eye out for AKI, which are the patients where you'll be really kind of being careful and you'll ask for regular tests to monitor for the GFR slash uh, creatinine. And then what all things can we do in the primary care setup? Um, and then when do we kind of um, refer the patients to um, a nephrology or send the patient directly to ED? So firstly, this is the KDGO uh, AKI definition. Now, uh, this is based on three parameters. One is, as you can see, um, there should be an increase in the serum creatinine. So this number is a magic number. Um, it is 26.5. So if we see the creatinine going up by 26.5 within 48 hours, that by definition constitutes AKI. Now you start wondering that, uh, you know, many times we see the creatinine going up by 26. It's not really a big number, but this has been deliberately put here because uh, we want the test to be very, very sensitive. So uh, sometimes you'd see, you know, creatinine going up at 30 and, you know, nothing changes. The next day the creatinine is improved, but we want to have a test which is highly sensitive, that number should be highly sensitive. So we pick up more patients and then act on them. The other way to define AKI is when you have a baseline kidney function. So let's say you have a, a old patient, you know, has renal impairment, and you have a creatinine of 110, in that case, you're looking for a creatinine jump of about 1.5 times from the baseline within the past seven days. So this is important because um, advanced CKD, especially we do see from time to time, you know, we get concerned. Creatinine was 240, now it's 280 or 270. Should we panic? Should we press the panic button? Or should we kind of wait and do some more tests or investigate further? The third definition is based on the urine volume. Now, I think this is more important when somebody is in the hospital where you can get a good measure of urine volume per hour. In the primary care setting, I don't think that this is really useful. Uh, many times patients with AKI will have almost normal urine output. And, and most of the times, uh, honestly, even if you ask somebody, are you peeing less now? They probably wouldn't know um, if you ask me if, if I peed less today as compared to yesterday, I probably won't be able to give you a good answer on that. So this, the third one is probably for the hospital setting rather than primary care. I would focus on these two things. So a crafting jump of more than 26 and a half would be important. Uh, many of us try to focus on the GFR and it happens with our renal registrars as well. They, when they present the case to us for discussion, they always talk about the GFR drop from this to this. And unfortunately, that is not a, a good way to, um, uh, to, um, to check for acute kidney injury. 
because it actually may underestimate the severity of the AKI. Um, sorry, I was receiving a call because I'm on call tonight and we don't have registrants. <laughs> okay, so that's the definition. And, and if you look at the stages of AKI, there are different stages. Um, um, it could be non-oligarch AKI or an oligarch AKI. We don't really need to remember all of these. The, the main purpose why these things are done is to get an, a sense of severity of AKI because that impacts the outcomes. So risk would be something which is you know, uh, happening a GFR, uh, a drop in the GFR of more than 25% or in creatinine increase by 1.5 times. That's a risk. This is the urine output criteria. Then if it's more than that, then it's injury, then failure and loss, which means patient has AKI for about four weeks or more. And then end-stage kidney disease, if there's no um, regain of uh, renal function for about three months or more. In which case, we, we know that the patient is going to need dialysis um, for the lifetime or transplantation. So this is the rifle criteria. We don't need to remember, but this just kind of tells you how bad the acute kidney injury is, and that has implications on the prognosis of the patient um, in terms of survival, as well as in terms of needing long-term uh, follow-ups and dialysis or renal replacement therapies. Why are we talking about this? Um, it's because any AKI, now good old days AKI, when I was a student, they used to talk about AKI, and you know, creatinine went up, came down, you know, everything is hunky dory But that's not the case. It's not as benign as we used to think. Any AKI has been associated with long-term adverse outcomes. So many studies have uh, put in some of them, I couldn't really fit in all those references here, but they've been associated with increased mortality even if you adjust it for all forms of comorbidities, AKI by itself is associated with high risk of mortality. And if somebody needs dialysis because of AKI, especially in the ICU, um, mortality in one study was reported up to 80%. So it's really terrible news if somebody has AKI and needs dialysis in an ICU setting. That means the person is not doing that great and the prognosis is bad. Um, different studies will sh show you mortality rate anywhere between 40 to um, 80 percent. Um, even for small change in creatinine, as I said, there has been uh, association with mortality. They did a pooled mortality rate, and uh, it was about 23.9 percent uh, with patients with AKI. So AKI is important. It can um, it can affect somebody's survival. This is an interesting graph. I, I liked it, so I put it here today, just to, won't try and confuse you, but um, generally speaking, a kidney lasts longer than a person, which means uh, most people will die with functioning kidney. Now, this is the, you know, the slide shows about the consequences of AKI on the kidney lifespan. So if somebody has got an AKI at a young age, then the, need for or the kidney function is going to go down relatively slower. But if you had AKI at an older age, you see from here, even though your GFR is quite high as compared to the normal kind of uh, um, percentile here, this is the normal range, you will have a significant drop. And even here, if you had AKI at an old age, the risk of having really low GFR and needing dialysis is much higher. So 10 ml per minute drop in GFR at a younger age is probably better tolerated as compared to 10 ml per uh, minute GFR loss because of AKI at, at an older age. So that's important. AKI at, in, in older people tends to have uh, worse outcomes as compared to the younger people. This is uh, the graph looking at hospital survival by the extent of AKI. So we spoke about the stages. Stage one is less severe. So clearly you can see patient survival and discharge was much lower if patients had severe AKI compared to those without AKI. So this is factoring in for all the other comorbidities, the reason they were in the hospital. But if somebody develops an AKI, then they will have a higher risk of mortality. And more severe the AKI, um, higher is the mortality. So let's say if these patients with AKI, even those who survive, they go home, 
what are the long-term problems with them? So this study looked at the long-term outcomes um, for it. And if you can see, we put in different parameters here, all cause mortality, cardiovascular, cancer-specific, heart failure, recurrent hospitalization for um, with AKI, and you know, uh, progression to CKD and in stage kidney disease, everything is higher if somebody has had an AKI. So all the more reason that we need to focus on prevention because even if somebody survives the hospital admission, if he has had AKI, then there'll be more troubles down the road. So if I have to just explain um, in a single line, once somebody has an, had an AKI, they're more likely to develop recurrent AKI. There's at a higher risk of developing chronic kidney disease or progression of CKD, leading to end-stage kidney disease, or they are at a higher risk of death. So prevention is the key here. Now, let's take a look at the different etiology of uh, AKI. This is going back to the med school days. Uh, I'm sure we are aware, but just to recap on these things would be important to understand what we can do to prevent AKI. Um, the most common one is pre-renal, which tells you it comes before the kidneys, which essentially means the perfusion. So if there is hypoperfusion of the kidneys, it can affect the kidney function. Next one is intrarenal. Again, there is something involving the renal parenchymal tissue, right? So the glomeruli, the tubules, etc. We'll come to it in a second. Next would be the post-renal, which essentially is a plumbing issue. So we don't deal with it. The urologist kindly help us with this, but that's something which is happening after the kidney, which essentially is obstruction. So what are the causes of uh, pre-renal AKI? Now we said this is before the kidneys, this is perfusion related. So anything that can cause hypoperfusion, uh, common things being blood loss, could be an accident, could be post-op, could be just a terrible GI bleed, blood loss of any sort, causing hypovolemia can lead to pre-renal AKI. Dehydration, um, again, irrespective of what the etiology is, um, it can cause pre-renal AKI. Heart failure, these are the complex ones which uh, some of the primary care colleagues have been talking about, um, that they do see AKI or worsening of creatinine in patients with heart failure as you titrate the diuretics. Sepsis infection definitely can cause low blood pressure affecting renal perfusion. And because it's perfusion, anything that stops that perfusion, you know, vascular occlusion can lead to pre-renal AKI initially. Next, what are the causes of intrinsic AKI? So as I said, like the commoner ones being, uh, or the more familiar ones being um, glomerulonephritis. So if you look at intrinsic, there are different components, the glomeruli, so we're talking about glomerulonephritis, there are tubules, so we're talking about acute tubular necrosis, which is listed here. And there are different you know, causes of that, drugs, toxins, infections, autoimmune disorders. Then you have the interstitium, so the drugs causing allergy, interstitial nephritis. And the last one is again, the smaller blood vessels, which vasculitis can cause troubles with. Post-renal, um, some of the causes, common ones that we deal um, in older men is prostate, um, whether it be common, kidney stones are the other common um, um, uh, etiology of uh, post-renal obstruction. Then there are those malignancies, clots, et cetera, which can also cause uh, post-obstructive AKI. Now, I'm going to start from the bottom because it's easier to deal with the uh, obstructive causes. A, actually, I don't deal with them, uh, but it's easier also to explain. The way to look at it, this is a block system. There's traffic jam here. The motorway is blocked. So where is the problem? So one way to think about it is, is a problem inside the lumen from the uh, ureters onwards into the bladder, into the urethra, or is it extra luminal, which means something is compressing on this uh, uh, drainage system and causing it to go, um, causing it to narrow. So the intrinsic causes up here are any foreign bodies, commonly the kidney stones, could be tumors coming into the lumen, could be clots because the patient has had hematuria, there's a bleed up here and the clots are sticking around here. 
um, the same um, from the outside. If uh, you know, it's a young person, a uh, young woman who's pregnant and it's in advanced stage of pregnancy can also compress the ureters. Again, external tumors can cause this. Down here, again, in the bladder, I have kidney, uh, sorry, bladder stones, you can have blood tumors. Down here is prostate, could be benign hyperplasia or carcinoma, or even urethral stitches, um, or, or there could be valves around here, especially in younger patients. But the important thing to remember is if it's down here, bladder or below it, then the obstruction tends to be bilateral. If it's unilateral, we generally don't look at this part, we focus on the, this part of the system. So some of the um, hints that can point out towards uh, obstructive uropathy, some, something that we should be aware of is these tends to be gradual in most patients, unless you know somebody's got a, you know, a stone stuck in the kidney and there's a sudden descent which causes tremendous pain, um, but generally tend to be uh, quite gradual and therefore they may not be painful. And more often than not, it tends to be unilateral or incomplete uh, bilateral, and uh, therefore may not be aneuric. That means the patient might still be passing normal amount of urine. Um, as it's mentioned here, it tends to be unilateral more often than not, unless the problem is down here. However, important to remember, even unilateral bad unilateral um, obstruction can lead to acute kidney injury. And these are the common causes that we've already mentioned. So when you have a suspicion of obstruction, somebody with a history of kidney stones or you know somebody who's older individual and you're suspecting prostate issues, then I think the starting test could be a renal ultrasound. And this is just a flow chart that kind of guide us into what should we do next. So if you do ask for a renal ultrasound, it could show a hydronephrosis. It may not show hydronephrosis. If it doesn't, but there is anything else like a kidney stone, which is still higher up, um, or if you pick up a tumor, then definitely you should refer them to urology. But here we're talking about obstructive ATI, so generally you're looking for hydronephrosis. If it's a suspected stone or tumor and you want to expedite things, then I think it's important that we get a CT scan here because that can delineate uh, the structure much better. And sometimes a smaller stone um, can be missed by the kidney ultrasound depending on the location. If you notice the um, hydronephrosis, you're definitely going to ask for urgent labs to see the extent of uh, renal impairment. If it's a good going increase in the creatinine or potassium or metabolic acidosis, you'll probably refer them straight to ED, bypassing the outpatient referral system. Um, if you see creatinine is slightly elevated from baseline, I think important to send to urology because this is an obstruction. If the obstruction is relieved, then um, the creatinine is expected to come down or at least improve. If the creatinine is um, at baseline itself, you can just ask uh, for a regular outpatient referral to urology because this might be just a chronic long standing thing and uh, this may not need immediate attention. So, once you have this, what are the initial investigations you're going to think about? So, from my perspective, I think these simple things to go from primary care is renal function, which will be creatinine, urea, and electrolytes. You should always check urine because these are the things we kind of uh, try and highlight quite often. MSU, it's also because if a system is obstructed, there's a small, well, there's a chance that this might get infected even. Um, so MSU is a uh, useful day. Albumin to creatinine ratio sometimes helps with uh, telling us how bad the injury has been to the kidneys. A mild urinacea could be just, a, you know, the local injury, but if it's a really good going urinacea, that could mean that the obstruction has caused damage to the kidney and you're seeing the effects of that. Uh, renal ultrasound is definitely indicated, even if somebody told you like, okay, you know, my urine output is good, I'm being normally, um, but this still is important. And uh, CDKUB, you may wait for it um, because it's, again, involves radiation, may not be easy to get. Um, so it's um, important that we get the ultrasound first. Moving on to the most common cause of AKI, the pre-renal AKI. Um, this, as we said, could be because of hypovolemia. Now the losses could be from the gastrointestinal system, which is the most common and we appreciate that. Somebody having diarrhea you know, and vomiting for whatever reason, um, you tend to become hypovolemic. 
So it's also important to remember that the hypovolemia could be because uh, of losses from the from the kidneys. So somebody who's on massive doses of diuretics or somebody who's on a low dose diuretic, um, but uh, was diuretic naive. So even a 40 milligram for a normal kidney function patient of a diuretic like furosemide could be a lot. Um, in the world of SCLT2 inhibitors, we need to remember this as well. The SCLT2 inhibitors um, work like a weak diuretic. Um, then there is hypovolemia. When you examine the patient, looks like you know the weight has gone up and looks overloaded. This can happen. This can also cause pre-renal because the fluid is not in the blood compartment, but it gone elsewhere, like ascites in cirrhosis, with heart failure. You get a lot of uh, pleural effusion, ascites again. Nephrotic syndrome can uh, produce similar picture. Um, next is somebody's blood pressure on the low side, which is a shock state, infection, um, cardiac causes, or hypovolemia. Um, that needs. That's kind of more often than not very obvious. There is something called relative hypotension. That means the blood pressure is fine. And this you can see when you use um, diuretics as well, um, that they, they tend to have slightly hypoperfusion, but um, the blood pressure is way better controlled than before. Um, but that can also lead to this. And here, any other medication which can cause hypertension can lead to hypoperfusion of the kidneys. Next, we said was the because this is pre renal, the blood supply. If there are problems with blood supply, stenosis, or if we use the NSAIDs or ACE inhibitors or these uh, CNIs, which is tactrolin and cyclosporin, the way these works is uh, you need prostaglandins and angiotensin 2 to maintain the glomerular perfusion. That means the blood flow to the glomeruli to, to sustain or maintain a GFR. And these work against those prostaglandins and angiotensin receptor two, uh, sorry, angiotensin two, um, and they counteract the natural compensatory effect of uh, uh, of the body on GFR. So that results in drop in GFR, increase in creatinine. So simple things to remember: fluid losses. These are the most common causes: gastroenteritis, GI bleed. Think about cardiorenal if the uh, patient has history of uh, previous. Um, coronary events or uh, heart failure, that uh, these medications by themselves can cause interest these days is important. It contains valsartan, which is the angiotensin receptor blocker, much like losartan. Um, and what we really hate to see, to be honest, is a triple whammy. Uh, we come to it, these are the you know three drug combinations. This puts patients at a higher risk of acute kidney injuries, and therefore we should be really be careful when we have somebody who's on ACE inhibitor or a diuretic combo, and then we are looking at giving NSAIDs. We should be really keeping an eye on the kidney function. Initial investigations remain more or less the same. The only thing which I would add here is if we are not sure uh, about this is you know pre-renal versus the patient look a little bit on the dry side, but not really dry, then sometimes the urine sodium to creatinine ratio um, actually is helpful as well. It's not that sensitive, but if you have really low sodium in the urine, that would favor um, uh, a pre etiology. Um, but there are fallacies if somebody's on a diuretic which pushes more sodium out, then you can't really use it. But otherwise, um, this could be a relatively useful um, tool to use a friend. How do we manage? So in the uh, clinic, you can obviously do a good examination um, watch for tachycardia if it's pre-renal, you know, has lost uh, a lot of fluids, then uh, you can expect some tachycardia. More importantly, postural hypotension. This is important, especially in the older individuals. I reckon many times with the busyness of our clinics, we don't check standing blood pressure, but I think it's important that we do that, um, especially in patients who are at risk mm -hmm. of developing AKI. Um, if the JVP is low or the mucous membranes are dry, definitely that supports our diagnosis. Then you look at the medications. You look at if the patient is on NSAIDs, then definitely you can keep away from uh, all the NSAIDs. If somebody's on, you know, uh, diuretic RAS blockers or ACLT2 inhibitors, whether you want to stop them or reduce the dose, depending on the severity, that could be considered. But these are easy fixes. And then 
you know, the management would be if you feel the person is on the dry side, you ask them to improve their fluid intake and repeat the bloods. If there is no improvement or, in fact, if there's worsening, then you can definitely discuss this with renal. And as before, if there is any metabolic abnormality, uh, hyperkalemia, acidosis, then you may have to refer them to ET. Moving on to the um, intrinsic AKI. Now, these tend to be, you know, um, they are difficult to kind of manage in a uh, primary care setting, but uh, we've had some very good referrals. Uh, some of our GP colleagues with really high index of suspicion have sent in the patients early, and that actually kind of resulted in quick management of these patients and quick treatment, which helps save a lot of kidney function, um, which has important uh, implications on the long-term survival as well. So important to know, um, and, and for this, you'll have a lower threshold to kind of contact us. So in a sense, um, there are four uh, components here, the glomeruli, so you can have glomerular nephritis, um, there are blood vessels within the kidney, um, you can have vasculitis, renal artery stenosis and thrombosis. Uh, the tubules can get affected, drugs or toxins can affect that. And the interstitium, this is one of the uh, people getting antibiotics and suddenly we see if, you know, a little while after that, that the creatin starts to creep up. Um, this needs to be kept in mind. How do we uh, go about looking at these patients? Uh, so there are things to watch for if the patient reports that, oh yeah, you know, I've, I think uh, the urine was pink or even red, um, that's an alarm. We need to uh, make sure that uh, we are not looking at the glomerular nephritis. If they report along with this thing, yeah, I see a lot of frothiness um, in the, in the uh, toilet pan and that should ring a bell. If you see a new edema or the patient's history of rash photosensitivity, which tells you that there's some autoimmune uh, problem going on there, or if they've got weight loss, joint ache, something which is not in keeping with your routine kind of follow up uh, in, the, in the clinic. Uh, when you see them, if it's a new onset hypertension, or if they look really fluid overloaded, you know, repeated edema, puffy face, or rash, and they've gained weight um, uh, for you know unclear reasons and in a very short time, that should also kind of uh, alert us that that could be something we need to investigate quickly. The standing, uh, standard um, investigations are more or less the renal function. We will cover these two. MSU, please do not forget. Uh, we do see quite regularly that uh, when you have increase in the creatinine, MSU is missed. It is really important as, in fact, uh, it's, MSU is also called as a poor man's biopsy, um, especially in developing countries where you don't have easy access to kidney biopsy. MSU can shed a lot of information, can give us a lot of information, can shed some light on these things. The urine ACR and PCR, both are important in certain cases, especially when I think of myeloma. And the best time to do this is in the morning. So first thing in the lab, just go ahead and do the ACR, which tends to correlate better. And then the renal ultrasound to exclude the other causes prior to that. Um, there'll be a lot more investigations that are needed for suspicion when you're suspecting a GN or you know something wrong with the tubules. I think um, in the primary care setting, you can obviously order this to expedite things. So autoimmune screen, including ANA, DSDNA complements, et cetera. Um, but many times it's very unclear whether we need to do these. So um, what we generally prefer is just contact us and then we are happy to kind of, you know, discuss the case together and then, and then maybe you can help us uh, get on with the initial investigations if it's not super urgent. Uh, if we feel this needs to be reviewed in the next day or so, then we definitely will call the patient. Um, renal ultrasound, um, if it's not being done, would be useful. Sometimes it's not possible to get it in time, and then we generally get the patient in the hospital and try and do that. But ultimately, what we're looking at is if there is any suspicion of glomerular nephritis, articular interstitial nephritis, then the most important uh, diagnostic test would be a kidney biopsy. So all these things will eventually lead to a kidney biopsy. But it's good to have that information upfront if possible. Um, so that's the reason serology is important. So when you see your patients, it's important to keep an eye on patients who would be at a high risk of AKI. Um, this is a 
um, brief kind of um, what should I say, a snapshot of who would be at a high risk. Elderly people definitely at a high risk of AKI. In fact, I am of the opinion again the research is not um, out there. I am of the opinion that ACE inhibitors should not be given as a first line in the hypertensives in older individuals um, who are hypertensive. That should not be because we see from time to time they develop AKI with that with one viral infection where their input or intake of fluids is less. So I'll I'll sound a bit more controversial, but this is my strong opinion that we should not be using uh, ACE inhibitors unless there are strong indications of why we need to in older people. Um, anybody with other comorbidities, diabetes, you know, our patients are quite comorbid, especially where I practice in South Auckland. Many of them are diabetic, so they'll be at a high risk. Previous heart disease or previous CKD, and if you have any other comorbidities, these will be at a high risk of developing acute kidney injury. We just mentioned the entire list here. This is again, this is not a, a complete list, but just to give you a sense, is if you're seeing an older diabetic individual with history of heart failure, already has some renal impairment, then definitely you need to be extra careful. I mean, being extra careful is also, it, it might just mean you ask them to repeat the test sooner than later. So AKI has uh, effects on, not just on the kidneys, you know, there are effects on other organs as well. And that's also uh, something that we need to be aware of. We, we talk about cardiorenal syndrome, but many times it's the kidneys which kind of get um, uh, into problem and then result in heart failure. Um, patient has slightly lower ejection fraction and the fluid overloads initiated by the kidneys actually lead them to further heart failure. So this needs to be, we need to be aware of. Um, there are um, different, um, what should I say, um, implications on the intestinal function. Intestines can get congested. Uh, you give them diuretics, they probably won't absorb because the furosemide is not going through. Um, there is a possibility that they have liver dysfunction. Again, we have heart failure, which could also lead to liver dysfunction. Fluid overload is one of the commonest things we see, but the worst one is Intraflopathy. So just to be aware that you know AKI or any kidney injury can affect different organ systems as well. Then we move on to what are common a couple of common um, problems that we see in primary care, and and that's when my um, my uh, GP friends actually wanted me to talk about this because um, it's good to refresh what should be done and when should we call because sometimes. Um, when the hospitals are busy, sometimes um, we, we've learned that the renal team might give you a pushback and then you're stuck with, you know, I did refer, but I, you know, they were saying like, okay, just repeat the test. So it's good to just recap on this very quickly. This is from the Edinburgh, um, Edinburgh Renal Handbook, but I thought this is like simplified version. It's easy to understand. So the, the what is some complication of AKI is hyperkalemia. We all would agree on that. So what do we do? So our threshold of lab cutoff is 5.3 here, but generally if it's less than 5.5, you don't need to really worry about it. Um, that we don't need to target or treat hyperkalemia per se. But if it's more than 5.5, then the first important step is to figure out, is it a true hyperkalemia or is it pseudo hyperkalemia? Which means the sample has been sitting in transit for a long period of time. And this happens quite often. In fact, when I'm on call, I I've been completely fed up with this because you do get calls. And the first thing now I've started asking from the lab is when was the sample taken? And it could be 10 in the morning, but it got delayed. And then the process, they process at eight in the evening and you have hyperkalemia, which I can't really rely on, which I can't really trust on. So that needs to be, um, that's need to be aware. But more often than not, when you see, now the lab will tell you the hemolyzed sample, which, which should make you aware that this could be uh, um, fictitious hypokalemia, in which case you just are better off just repeating with the next three days. But just bear in mind, if you have increase in potassium and there is increase in creatinine, there's usually you're better off kind of presuming that this is a real hypokalemia. In which case, what do we do? So this one is a table, again, not to confuse, but I, I found it quite, uh, you know, simplified kind of version of what do we do when uh, depending on the level of potassium. So if it's mild hypokalemia, 
the patient is otherwise well and no kidney injury, which is not what we're talking today, but it's safer to repeat within the first, within the next two weeks, basically. It's something which is unexpected, you're not really expecting, then you can repeat it sooner. If it's mild uh, hypokalemia, but the patient has AKR, which is what we're talking about, then if you feel that the, the AKI warrants hospital admission or referral to the hospital, then you would generally, this will be one more additional thing that will make you consider, okay, maybe he's got good going AKI. Now there's mild hypokalemia, all the more reason I should refer him to the hospital. If this is not the case, and you see the patient is on, you know, ACE inhibitor or ARB, um, you would think about, you know, you could consider, let's reduce the dose, let's call it back again and recheck um, after reducing the dose. That might be enough to kind of um, improve the hypokalemia. If it's moderate, no AKI, can you can just repeat it the next day. But if it's moderate hypokalemia and there is AKI, or the patient looks unwell for whatever the reason, then you probably are better off sending the patients to the hospital. We may have to do an ECG, see for changes of hypokalemia. If somebody's on RAS blockers, you're better off asking them, okay, stop taking this and we will restart once the hypokalemia has resolved. The last one is severe hypokalemia. You'll see consistent story here. You have no choice but to refer the patient to the hospital, irrespective of they are on RAS blockers or no, you are better off sending them to the hospital. Here again, we can use the, you know, the binders and all, the rhizonium, and we can talk about it in a bit. So these are the two um, more common scenarios that you, you would think about sending to the hospital. Next, your patient has had hypokalemia. Now you want to make sure they don't keep having it. Otherwise, it's kind of going to keep you awake at night, probably. Um, so what we need to do in all the patients, we look for causes. If there is a story of um, full dose RAS blockade, you know, candy sartan at 32 milligrams. Um, on top of that, you've got somebody else, somebody started on spironolactone on top of that. Look for those causes, review the medications. Diet is very important in patients that I see. Um, in fact, uh, many of them would have uh, consumed, you know, foods rich in, in potassium. So we definitely need to address this. Otherwise, it will keep happening. Um, if somebody, as I said, an older individual who does not have any strong indication such as heart failure or diabetic nephropathy or proteinuric CKD, then you might want to think about do I really need to keep him on a RAS blocker when he's experiencing hyperkalemia, which could be lethal. Um, if there are other medications which can cause protection to go up like these, you should definitely see whether we can stop them. If the patient has advanced CKD and if the bicarb is low, um, then you can put them on some oral sodium bicarbonate. This also has been shown to improve long-term outcomes slightly in, in terms of um, GFR preservation. Explore dietary protection intake. If somebody is uh, you know, diabetic, try and work on that. Uh, otherwise, the binder. Zirconium is not available here. Um, it's a newer uh, binder for potassium, but we definitely have calcium rhizonium, which tastes yucky, but that's all what we have. And it seems to work. So in the modern era, this was a nice slide in one of our journals here. Just monitor the, or keep an eye on the potassium. Uh, it's a simple thing. Sometimes the patients really don't like them. If you ask them to stop eating kiwis and bananas, but you have to explain them this is important. Um, RAS blocker, we said, you know, you can either reduce or cessation. Um, if somebody's got heart failure, you might be actually taking away the benefit from them, but you know, you may revisit um, and you might withhold it and then revisit down the road. Uh, binders, um, they allow you to continue using the RAS blocker. If somebody has heart failure, you can just put them on. The thing is, it's uh, cost. I mean, it's free for us. So we don't really think too much about this generally, which we should be. But anyhow, but it's, it's a taste which most of my patients have been complaining about. They don't really like it. They, tend, they feel like they're going to throw up. SGLT2 inhibitor, this in studies have shown to actually use of SGLT2 inhibitor has been shown to be associated with reduced risk of hypokalemia in a trial setting, but then the indication is more important. And if uh, somebody can be on it, then definitely you should leave them on. Next is the fluid overload. Um, we deal with this uh, a lot, um, complication of AKI. 
and I'm sure you do too. So this, the two common um, diuretics that we use here is furosemide and bimetanide, the loop diuretics. Um, there's confusion. Uh, many people think that if you use this, then you are preventing or actually treating acute kidney injury. But there is research has shown there is no direct benefit of these uh, diuretics on prevention of AKI. So you're not really preventing this thing, you're just treating the complication. However, if you start somebody on a diuretic, just make sure you are monitoring the renal function and electrolytes regularly for hyponatremia, hyperkalemia. You're monitoring the volume status, which many times, I mean, back in Canada, we used to have a nice uh, flow chart. It's easy as we used to give them a titration chart for diuretics uh, based on the weight to give them the range of the weight. And if the weight goes below that, you back off to this dose. If the weight goes up, you increase the dose of furosemide and you know, take this dose. So if they can monitor weight at home, then that, that's a good uh, way to keep to titrate the diuretics. Uh, one important thing here is um, this is based on physiological research. If you're using uh, furosemide in somebody with almost normal GFR, then you probably are better off titrating, especially furosemide, you're better off titrating twice a day rather than once a day. It's just because the kidneys compensate by absorbing more sodium. So we'll try and use them twice a day if possible. Um, be mindful, um, many of my patients have history of gout. So just keep an eye on the urate level um, and just warn them that this could uh, result in um, increased risk of acute gout. Um, and then if you can limit the use of diuretics, then that's better even. The third situation where uh, my primary care colleagues have expressed concern about is what do we do if patients have metabolic acidosis? So if the um, patients have less severe AKI, um, whereby we don't need to really put them on dialysis, then um, acidosis can be treated with just oral sodibic, which is what we get here. Um, there is um, some uh, research now, there's a meta-analysis which showed that if you use um, uh, sodibic in patients with CK, um, then in the long term, it, it could help a little bit in preserving the GFR. So treating acidosis with sodibic is not a bad idea, especially in CKD. But if there are other causes of acidosis, then your sodibic is not going to work. Or if it's severe acidosis, then oral sodibic does not have enough uh, bicarbonate to help you. Now let's move on to a couple of quick cases. I've kept them simple, but these are generally the common scenarios which you see in your, in your practice. So first is a 73-year-old gentleman who presents to you with a history of fall. It's a, it's a traumatic fall, uh, most likely, and he's hurt his elbow. He comes to you because the elbow side, you know, he's got significant pain in the elbow. But he also reports when you start inquiring from him, he said, yeah, I mean, I've had a few days of being a bit lightheaded as well. Um, he's got comorbidities. He's, he's got diabetes, hypertension, and stage 3 CKD. Uh, it's a protein in CKD, so AS3 because of diabetes and hypertension, and he's got this lipidemia. So he's got these risk factors. Remember the risk factors we spoke about? He's on medications, low sartan, hydrochlorothiazide, um, amlodipine, and SDA due to inhibitor here. Um, so this is this regular uh, prescription. You do an exam, his uh, heart rate is fine. Um, his blood pressure is 112. JVP is on the lower side, we didn't find any obvious um, fracture. It didn't appear to be a severe injury, but he's got a bruise on the elbow. Now, what do you do from here on? Um, you ask for a blood test. You ask for an x-ray just to be absolutely sure if there's no fracture there. But this guy got prescribed silicoxib as a pain relief because he said, okay, you know, I took Panadol at home, didn't really work. So he said, okay, we'll give him something more. I'll uh, give him silicoxib. We got, got him to repeat the bloods, which he did, um, you know, the next day, your creatinine has already gone up to 150 uh, from 120. Uh, mild hyponatremia, but urine, he's not done it. Uh, we've not really asked for it. We just asked for the bloods. And his FBC is normal. CRP was fine as well, which I'm not mentioning here. So as per definition, creatinine rises more than 26 here, it's about 30. So you'll think about, oh yeah, this patient has definitely got an AKI and he's got underlying CKD. So it's AKI on CKD. 
Now you start wondering what's the etiology. So we go stepwise. We think about the previous causes. Um, he's on a diuretic. He's on a CLG2 inhibitor, which is like a weak diuretic. He's on an ARB. Um, his blood pressure with these was a little bit on the lower side. You checked the JVP, which was low uh, as well. Clinically, you were thinking that this is he's probably on the dry side. Um, maybe we could have checked the standing blood pressure, which would be more useful, and we could have probed a little bit more about the postural symptoms. He was given uh, celecoxib, which is a non-steroidal as well. Now you're thinking about, wait a minute, he's on diuretic, he's on an ARB, and he's on NSAID, so is this triple whammy? Or actually, this could be a quadruple whammy now because he's on SCLG2 inhibitor as well. So you're thinking on those lines, okay, there's a possibility that this is just a pre component. But given his age, we start wondering, does he have a prostatomegaly, benign prostatic hyperplasia? So maybe we could have just uh, revisited whether he's got any urinary flow symptoms or if he reports, most people will not tell you, but if he actually reports any reduction in the urine output or if he's got any um, hesitancy um, or, or nocturia many times, that will be a good clue to tell you. Intrinsic, um, you inquired about previous antibiotics. You can ask for an MSC and urine ACR. You can ask for other symptoms. Really not thinking about um, intrinsic. Because A, that's less common, but there's nothing in the history. The history is more in keeping with these, the first one rather than even the second one. Third one looks less likely. So what do we do? We ask him to improve his hydration. We could ask him to withhold low sartan and hydrochlorothiazide. It's going to help you two ways. It's going to improve the blood pressure, which will help the renal perfusion. Um, hydrochlorothiazide is a diuretic, so it's going to improve the uh, fluid status as well. Low sartan at the time of AKI, it's better off that we can hold this. Um, you may want to think about whether it's, you know, if the there's no improvement, then whether you are thinking of even asking to withhold the empathy flaws in for a bit. Um, he was on silicoxid. You decided, okay, please stop that. Let's use paracetamol. Again, these are you know, second and third line medications for pain relief, but from kidney perspective, these are relatively safe. You will ask for MSCU just to make sure that there's nothing else going on along with the morning sample urine ACR. And because he's got baseline CKD, it's important to have at least a real ultrasound uh, if it's not already done in the past. Then we can ask him to repeat the creatinine in a couple of days. Um, you expect it to improve, or if it's still turning up, and while these things are pending, the labs are pending, you may want to talk to uh, renal at that point in time. Moving on to a second case. Um, this is a young lady who did not have any previous uh, health issues. Doesn't see you with non-specific symptoms. So she's like, yeah, I've been feeling weak for a few days. I just got joint aches. I've been feeling quite tired. Um, and I had some abdominal pain. When you ask, okay, you know, what happened? This sounds a bit more viral. She confirmed that she had uh, possibly viral pharyngitis five days ago. Um, she decided not to come to you. She decided she's going to take some ibuprofen from the supermarket. And then subsequently, she noticed the urine has been a bit pinkish. And you confirmed that you know she's not menstruating at that point in time. So now these are concerning things. You do an exam. Blood pressure is on the high side. But you also notice that she's got rash on both the legs. And then she's got a bit of fluid in the ankle area. The JVP is about four to five, so slightly more full. Systemic examination otherwise was unremarkable. So then you start wondering uh, what's going on because here are the things that you shouldn't see in a 25-year-old, the blood pressure being high, fetal edema, and you know, with this history, is there something else going on? And importantly, the rash. So what caused the rash? You looked at this. And this is the way the rash looks. It's a macular rash. And you start wondering whether this is those classical leukocytoclastic vasculitis kind of picture going on in the skin. And this is important because this could be the present sign in three quarters of the patients uh, in the disease that we're going to talk about. So this is an important finding that you picked up. You asked for the blood, blood scheme come back. Um, these were urgent blood, so you see that the cramp is elevated. Importantly, midstream urine, a lot of red cells, quite a few white cells, 
epithelial cells, an important note, because this is normal. If it's really high, let's say you had epithelial cells of 40 to 50, then you're not 100% sure because this could be a contaminated sample. Epithelial cells can come from the surrounding skin. You also did an ACR. This is a random ACR where it came out elevated. So you're now concerned. So given a history, she had viral, she took an NSAID, you know, whether this is pre-renal, at least in part contributing. This could be post-renal, possibly not. So you're going stepwise in your head. Most likely, this is intrinsic renal. And the clues I mentioned, active urine sediment with a lot of red cells and white cells in a good sample, new proteinuria, renal dysfunction, hypertension, fetal edema, rash, classical. They're thinking about a possible GN. And this patient, when she came to the hospital urgently, kindly referred by you, based on the test, um, had a kidney biopsy and was found to have IgA nephropathy, which is one of the commoner ones in young patients. The urine tends to have what we classically see as red cell cast. If you ask in the community, I don't think so you will get um, somebody to do a red cell cast for you, um, but this is generally what we look for. Cast is basically red cells are trapped in one structure. Uh, it's like a you know, a pathognomic feature of, um, of uh, a glomerulonephritis. And then you also see dysmorphic this. Um, I remember one of my GP friends has requested, and we did get some uh, results on this. If it's more than 80%, tends to be really more significant compared to if you have 20, 30%, which may or may not be very specific. All this means the red cells, as they're coming out of the glomeruli, they get deformed and they lose their regular biconcave shape and they look funny and dysmorphic. So you referred the patient urgently to renal. Um, at the same time, you ask for some serology because you want to make sure that ANA, you know, young female, whether there's lupus going on, ANA complements, et cetera, were ordered. Um, you can also ask for hepatitis um, B, C, HIV, um, kidney ultrasound. But the end result was she needed an urgent biopsy, which was uh, done. And based on that, we started using steroids. Uh, she was given cyclophosphamide. Apologies for the spelling mistake here. Um, and in young individuals, cyclophosphamide is a bit toxic uh, to the ovaries, so we had to go through some hoops for that. But the patient had a good outcome subsequently. Moving on away from the world of acute kidney injury, I thought uh, there are a few things happening in the world of CKD and hypertension. So I thought to give you guys a quick update. Um, um, hopefully in the next five to 10 minutes, we'll try and wind this up. Um, important one. Um, so we've got this renal, the KDGO uh, guidelines, which are really important guidelines for patients in CKD. So they have a few updates last year, which I thought would be important just to you know, run past. It's important to be aware that this is going to come. Um, one of the newer ones was uh, talking about SGLD2 inhibitors and what was important as compared to what we've seen before is the GFR cutoff. So here, um, I think as per Pharma Act, the special authority criteria is if you have GFR of more than 30, then it will be funded. That has to be one of the criteria. So if the GFR is 29, then um, you say, sorry, mate, um, we can't fund you for this. But there are a couple of trials. In fact, uh, there's one DAPA CKD, which uh, enrolled patients with GFR of more than 25. The cutoff was 25, not 30, uh, in the, which was in the previous trials. But these two trials actually um, had patients enrolled who had GFR of over 20. And uh, in this EMPA kidney, which is the latest one, the trial was stopped because the benefit was so prominent that they had to actually stop. Like, you know, we've reached the endpoints way earlier, so we don't need to continue the entire trial. And this is where we are kind of going now. Um, so in the future, maybe Pharmac will change the cutoff criteria for GFR. In private, however, um, I've spoken to my patients because the benefit is quite profound on kidneys as well as on the heart, mainly heart failure, that I've started prescribing them and they're happy to self-fund uh, complete flaws. And so uh, if, if you see any of my clinical letters mentioning that we'll start in particular flaws and the GFR is 26, don't be surprised. There is some um, there's some evidence around that, and that we can still use it. Next one is um, 
the use of SGLT2 inhibitor, effectively flaws in DAPA, et cetera, we've got DAPA here, in non-diabetic patients with proteinuric CKD. So uh, this guideline, this is another guideline uh, basically coming up, and you'll see those more and more kind of talked about. And actually, I've started already using, some of my patients are already on um, the uh, SGLT2 inhibitor. They do not have diabetes now. Uh, unfortunately, of you know the way it was, the drug was developed was uh, promoted and uh, spoken about as the diabetes medication. If you ask to my diabetes colleagues, um, uh, the effect on the glucose is not uh, is probably they'll say, tell that this is probably a moderate effect on the on on the glucose. It's it's more on the other benefits that we focus on. In fact, one of the big guns in uh, in nephrology and hypertension actually I'm talking about four years ago, um, he was, he actually said this is a, not the drug for the, the endocrinologist, this is a drug for nephrologists and cardiologists um, because of the, the benefit uh, that we see in such patients. So uh, the epikidney trial had uh, less than half of patients had diabetes. So there were quite a few patients without diabetes and they had proteinuria. So I have recently started, like some, something similar would be a patient with IgA nephropathy who has proteinuria, and uh, they showed that empagliflozin reduced the incidence of end-stage kidney disease. So there is benefit in patients who do not have diabetes, even though this is a diabetes pill, so-called, um, but you can use it in patients with proteinuria, irrespective of the cause. So that's where I've started using it a lot, and I've actually had um, a polite question from uh, one of the GPs who asked me, you know, patient, just to let you know, patient is not a diabetic, but this is the story behind this. So um, patient, obviously, this is not funded, so patients have to pay, um, but it's not terribly expensive. I think it costs about $85, $87 for uh, five milligrams for a month's course. Um, the other one which, uh, uh, which I like to highlight is there is uh, these new mineral hot-cord receptor antagonists. So this is the future. I'm just giving you a, a quick window into this. Um, you know, the spironolactone that we use is a mineral hot-cord receptor antagonist, but has a lot of side effects, especially with gynecomastia and irregular menses in women. But then you have the advent of these non-steroidal, which have less side effects of spironolactone, and they are... Uh, coming and it's actually already incorporated uh, uh, into international guidelines now that you can use these medications um, with patients with an EGFR of more than 25 and albuminuria, and they have shown to have benefit. So one of the medications that I'm I'm actually going to do a, a grand round here at Middlemore uh, is about phenylalanine. So this is a new kid on the block, new as a new here, but it's been um, uh, fairly well researched now. Uh, this was the NEGM paper, which talks about the effect of phenylalanine in the kidney disease. I'll keep it short. It reduced the um, development of, um, you know, um, kidney failure or death from renal causes by 18%. Now, these were the patients who were already on um, ACE inhibitors or ARBs. So you have added benefit. And this is the way they advise us to titrate the drugs because, again, like spironolactone, this can also cause hyperkalemia. Well, I think we'll talk more about this once this becomes available in New Zealand. So these were the promising things coming, uh, you know, on the horizon that you will see uh, hopefully in the near future. But there's some bad news as well, which I'd like to share. Um, you know, uh, when people have kidney stones, we try and, from as a nephrologist, we try and um, work them up, do a metabolic screen to try and reduce the risk of recurrence. So you want to prevent the kidney stones from coming back, which seem to happen quite regularly. And uh, this is nice guidelines. And actually, one of the treatment that we use is thiazide diuretics, so chlorothaladone and hydrochlorothiazide. Um, they say consider thiazides in someone with recurrence of stones that are predominantly calcium oxalate and hypercalciuria uh, after um, salt restriction, essentially. So this was one of our mainstays which we, we would use. In fact, most of us use uh, thiazide diuretic. But this article came uh, a few months ago and they were looking at um, 
uh, use of hydropeptides at, at different doses, 12.5, 25, and 50 milligrams, and they were looking at recurrence of uh, uh, kidney stone, whether it actually helps prevent it. And I'll just show you, oops, I think the conclusion has gone away. But in a sense, it did not show any difference in terms of prevention. So hydrochlorothiazide did not improve the uh, recurrence risk um, of a kidney stone. In fact, they saw a lot of these people had side effects because of it being a diuretic, so gout, hyperkalemia, new onset diabetes, mellitus, and the creatinine jumping up. Um, so it's kind of disappointing that we don't have very much in terms of you know, medication that we can use to prevent kidney stones from coming back. Next one, again, this is, I've spoken about it a lot in the past. You know, does the timing of antihypertensive matter? This question keeps coming back again and again, and I think it's an important question. We were based on previous weak trials, or, you know, we took some uh, subgroup analysis from one of the other trials, and we said, uh, well, the research showed that maybe if you dose them at night, it actually helps reduce uh, cardiovascular events, which made sense. So I started doing it a lot, actually. I started you know, putting most of my patients on at least one pill at night to, to help with the circadian blood pressure fluctuation as well. But I always spoke about, let's wait for the time study, and time will tell, I used to say, uh, whether this is going to be useful. So this study is a really big one. 21,000 patients followed up for over five years. Unfortunately, it did not show that if you dose somebody um, morning compared to evening or night time um, uh, with an antihypertensive, there was no improvement in uh, a composite of vascular death or hospitalization for non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke. So the cardiovascular benefit, which smaller studies were showing and we were hoping they were true because it was a dramatic improvement, actually is not there. So the largest or the biggest trial um, tells you that it doesn't really matter um, um, uh, if you dose it in the morning or if you dose the anti at night. So that was a bit disappointing to kind of know. All right, I think we are up on time. So I'll just give you a quick uh, um, slide for take-home messages. I think I've shown you um, enough um, in numbers that you know AKI is not as benign as we used to think earlier. So anything with anybody with AKI, um, you need to keep a close eye uh, on it. In fact, I'll go um, one step further and say there, there are studies which I haven't uh, put up here in the interest of time. Um, and they showed that if somebody had an AKI and the creatinine improved or normalized, subsequently also had troubles in the future because you know we measure creatinine, creatinine looks normal, GFR is calculated based on the creatinine, and that is normalized. It doesn't mean the problem is over. It means you could still have future problems. I'll explain subsequently why. Um, AKI can have impact on long-term outcomes, including mortality, and I've shown you the slide, it could affect other organs as well. Um, early recognition is therefore the key, the magic number 26. It's a low threshold, but we want to capture more people. Uh, prevention is important. It's definitely, definitely better than cure. If somebody has progressive AKI based on that rifle criteria, if the CVRT increases. If we don't do anything, they'll end up with more problems down, down the road. And we should try and focus on, at least in primary care, whatever we can do uh, with our limited time, you know, the pressure on the system, at least we could try and identify um, you know, uh, any insults which which can, or any risk factors which can lead to um, AKI, especially you remember the triple whammy and the quadruple whammy um, and, and just ensure the patient is well hydrated and all those things. Um, important to not miss intrinsic AKI, active urine sediment, which means microscopic maturity. Generally you have uh, um, some white cells in the, in, in the urine. And if you do the ACR, which you do all the time with it, if ACR is abnormally high, these two things should trigger um, that this patient would need um, urgent attention. And you can, you know, feel free to call us uh, if if you're not very sure what to do with this. Cool. So that's the talk. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take those. 
Okay, Harry, thank you very much for that. That was very comprehensive. Uh, just a quick question. I was listening to a British podcast recently about blood pressure targets for people with slowish EGFRs. They were saying it's the same for whether they've got kidney problems or not. Is that your view? So so it's it's interesting because if you look at different guidelines, so generally we, uh, you could see the old school JNC, you could see the CHIP guidelines. So my boss in Canada was involved with the CHIP guidelines, so I'm a little bit biased towards that. Um, and based on the sprint trial, Bruce, we've discussed, you and me have discussed sprint trial many times. Um, off late for CKD, the target blood pressure should be less than 130 over 80. Now, there's a catch here. We need to understand which is where things get a bit tricky. Um, the sprint trial, which also had high risk patients, um, the blood pressure target was close to 120. But they used the um, automated blood pressure monitor, which is what most of us have in our clinics. It's automated. It's not the manual one which tends to be lower by five as compared to your mercury spigma manometer, right? So if you're checking and it's five millimeters lower, so if you read my letters also, sometimes it's confusing for people, but there's a background to it. I say about less than 130 or 80 in the clinic, and that has to be at rest after a few minutes of rest. Please do not take it immediately, you know, because the patient is rushed. It'll be wrong most of the times. And less than 125 at home, if tolerated. Factoring it that home blood pressure tends to be more the automated ones as compared to clinic. So that, without going into different discussion around different guidelines and what people feel, I think if you remember this number, less than 130 or 80 in the clinic, less than 125 at home, I think that's a safer number. Okay, so please can you repeat the advice about twice a day diuretics and patients with overload? Most often than not, we end up using a loop diuretic such as furosemide, which is probably the commonest one. Next, we use bumetanide. Furosemide, what it does is it, it works in the loop of Henle and it excretes, you excrete the sodium, which drives with it the water, right? It's a shorter acting pill. So it works for about six hours, roughly speaking. What happens after six hours, kidneys are smart organs. Right. That's the reason I took up nephrology, by the way. Um, okay. um, they try and compensate. After six hours of the furosemide is washed out of the system, they will compensate. They will feel, hey, we've lost a lot of sodium. They will sense that. They will start absorbing more sodium. With it will come the water. So this is physiological studies which have showed us. Initially, people will lose water. But after six to eight hours, the kidneys will reabsorb the extra water. So you may not see a difference or change in weight or, you know, the fluid overload might still remain the same, especially when the kidneys are normal or almost normal. In CKD, it's a different problem because the tubules don't work really that well. So if you have somebody like this where you're concerned, let's say heart failure, the kidney function is almost normal, it's more sensible or physiologically more appropriate, I shouldn't use the word sensible, more appropriate dose them twice. So if you want to do 80 milligrams, don't give them 80 at one go. Maybe try, you know, try doing 40 at breakfast and 40 around lunchtime. That that should hopefully work better. That's the rationale behind it. Okay. And somebody wondered what is your definition for older person regarding ACE inhibitors? I'm guessing the chronology is part of it as well as physical age uh, frailty. Studies haven't had a consistent definition of uh, older people. Um, most studies will tell you it's more than 65. I generally look at it if somebody's more than 70 and does not have other risk factors. Risk factors including coronary artery disease, heart failure, uh, kidney disease with proteinuria. I'm talking about with proteinuria. There is no advantage if somebody has ischemic nephropathy, GFR is, okay, let's say 60, patient is 75, has migraine impairment, there is no great advantage of an ACE inhibitor just because patient has renal impairment. ACE inhibitors are useful when there is proteinuria, be it diabetic or non-diabetic, diabetic more than non-diabetic. So recently, um, in fact, this is just uh, last week's clinic, I saw a gentleman with referred for AKI on CKD, had no indication, otherwise, very, very well functioning, high functioning person. He's probably fitter than I am. 
Uh, he's, he's probably around 76. I stopped his sales and bitter straight away. I'm like, if I if he gets recurrent AKI, his kidneys are gonna go into you know a failure. He'll have we have essentially shortening his lifespan. And uh, I think there is some evidence around the risk of hospitalization because of hyperkalemia or AKI in such patients. So health economics also doesn't um, from that perspective doesn't make sense to use. So I, I would consider more than seventy otherwise well. And if you have just one or two agents for blood pressure, I go safer with um, amlodipine or pelodipine, catch channel blockers. Um, that would be my first line. What else would you use in older people? What, what are your other first choice drugs in older people? So again, um, if, if if we need a low dose diuretic would be uh, also useful. Third line, I would definitely go into uh, ACE inhibitor or ARB because in blood pressure control becomes more important than the risk of AKI, but then we have to monitor closely and make sure the patient doesn't get dehydrated. Um, I'm not a big fan of doxazosin uh, as a first line. Unfortunately, in New Zealand, we have to start doxazosin before we can think of tamsulosin for prostate um, because we need special authority for that. Uh, but doxazosin in one of the biggest trials, old school trial um, called ALHAT, showed increased risk of heart, new onset heart failure in one of the four arms. They were looking at four different antihypertensives. They had to stop the doxazosin arm purely because of heart failure. So I don't prescribe patients doxazosin unless I have to have to. Uh, in patients who are on the, the triple whammy drugs, the non-steroidals, how often would you suggest checking renal function? And are you going to pick up an acute kidney injury or will it um, maybe not manifest itself? So, so again, it depends on um, what the dose that we're using. If somebody is on a good uh, dose of, let's say, candy sartan, 32 milligrams, and chlorothaladon, 50, then the risk is going to be much higher, in, and, and especially if the patient is older. Then I would say if I'm starting somebody on NSAIDs, I would recheck at least within the first week itself to see if things are going well. I will revisit whether I need to keep this patient on a non-steroidal at all, after a week, um, if it's you know irrespective, like let's say if somebody's got gout, uh, you'd be better off using prednisone or colchicine um, compared to non steroids which you might use in the first day or two, but then ask the patient to stop it as soon as the prednisone kicks in. It's many times we we um, you know our patient literacy sometimes is not that great, so I see that a lot. Uh, patient was prescribed um, NSAID for a couple of weeks for gout. And the intention was, okay, we'll give you enough so that it'll last you for a bit more, but they don't stop even if they're pain-free. Like, oh, this will help prevent gout. So that's oh, the, right. So sometimes, yeah, I've seen a few cases like this, and I'm like, no, this was given to you to just reduce the inflammation up front. So I would definitely assess the, if somebody needs insects for a longer period of time, irrespective of asymptomatic or no, I start getting concerned. Okay. Uh, just one last question here, because we're at time. What are the indications for L SGLT2 inhibitors in proteinuria? So anybody with significant proteinuria, um, irrespective of the etiology of proteinuria, uh, we are speaking of most glomerulonephritis, burnt out diseases, um, uh, you can start empagliflozin. It's not going to be funded uh, because it's funded only for a specific diabetic population with uh, uh, other criteria being Maori, I think, and uh, cardiovascular risk of more than 15%. Um, those bits, so most patients will not fit that criteria. Uh, but as I, as I showed you from Empakini trial, um, that uh, it tends to reduce the risk of end-stage kidney disease, and therefore it is really useful um, to start them on. So if patients can afford, I actually have started using, I've got quite a few patients now who are on uh, uh, empagliflozin. But as again, like the monitoring would be more or less the same because it can cause slight decline in the GFR, which like an ACE inhibitor would do. You can have a temporary down uh, slope and then over a period of time, it should remain stable. If it's going downhill, then I have no choice but to stop it. So Hari, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation tonight. We really, really appreciate that. And um, uh, thank you to the audience for all the questions. So um, good night, everybody. Thanks, Bruce. Good night.